and welcome to the fourth video of the ISTQB Certified Tester Foundation Level Preparation course. My name is Mitri, and I'm a Creative Manager at Exact Pro. Today, we will cover Chapter 4, Test Techniques. Let's start with the definition. Test technique is a procedure used to define test conditions, design test cases, and specify test data. Some techniques are more applicable to certain situations and test levels, others applicable to all test levels. When creating test cases, testers generally use a combination of test techniques to achieve the best results from the test effort. As we have mentioned before, testing is context-dependent and may have different levels of formality. Formal testing has very extensive documentation outlining test strategies, plans, reports, etc. It is usually well controlled and includes a description of entry and exit criteria. Informal testing, on the other hand, may have none of that. Just some notes with tentative plans on what to test. Each project team chooses the approach and the level of formality depending on the system complexity, implied risks, required time, allocated budget, as well as on the standard practice within the company. Basically, what works for one project may not work for another. The previous chapter focused on static test techniques. The time has come to review the dynamic ones. Dynamic test techniques are classified as black box, white box, or experience-based ones. The first type is called black box test techniques. They comprise test techniques based on an analysis of the specification of a component or system. Here, the testers don't know how a system or component is structured internally. The tester concentrates on what the program does, not how it does it. Black box test techniques look at the inputs and the outputs of the test object without referencing its internal structure. They're based on an analysis of the appropriate requirements, specifications, or business processes. Test cases may be used to detect gaps between the requirements and their implementation, as well as deviations from them. These techniques are applicable to both functional and non-functional testing. Then there is a type called white box test techniques. Any white box test technique is only based on the internal structure of a component or a system. When you have access to the code, tests can ensure that all internal components have been adequately exercised. It can be applied at all test levels, but the two code-related techniques discussed in this section are most commonly used at the component test level. Experience-based test techniques leverage the experience of developers, testers, and users to design and execute tests. This knowledge includes the expected use of the software, its environment, likely defects, and the distribution of those defects. These techniques are often combined with black box test techniques and white box test techniques. The choice of which test techniques to use depends on a number of factors, including component or system complexity, regulatory standards, customer or contractual requirements, risk level and types, available documentation, tester knowledge and skills, available tools, time and budget, software development lifecycle model, and the types of expected defects. Black box test techniques, also known as specification-based or input-output driven techniques or behavior-based techniques, regard the software as, you guessed it, a black box. Let me say it one more time. Testers don't necessarily know how the system or component is structured inside. They concentrate on what the software does. Here are five black box testing techniques described in the STQB foundation level syllabus. Number one, equivalence partitioning. It can be applied at any test level and is often a good technique to start with. Here is how it works. It divides data into partitions. An equivalence partition is a subset of the value domain of a variable within a component or system in which all values are expected to be treated the same based on the specification. So all items falling within a given partition are expected to be processed in the same way. Valid values should be accepted by the system. An equivalence partition containing valid values is called a valid equivalence partition. 
and invalid ones should be rejected. An equivalence partition containing invalid values is called an invalid equivalence partition. Partitions can be identified for any data element as well as for interface parameters. Any partition may be divided into subpartitions if required. Each value must belong to one equivalence partition only. When invalid equivalence partitions are used in test cases, they should be tested individually to ensure that failures are not masked. This can happen when several failures occur at the same time, but only one is visible, causing the other ones to go undetected. Let's look at the definition of coverage. It's the degree to which specified coverage items have been determined to have been exercised by a test suite expressed as a percentage. To achieve 100% coverage with this technique, test cases must process all identified partitions, including invalid ones, by using a minimum of one value per partition. This is because we are assuming that all conditions in one partition will be treated in the same way by the software. If one condition in a partition works, we suppose that all of the conditions in that partition will work. And so there is little point in testing the others. If one of the conditions in the partition does not work, then we assume that none of the conditions in that partition will work. So there isn't any reason to continue testing that partition. Coverage is measured as the number of equivalence partitions tested by at least one value divided by the total number of identified equivalence partitions, normally expressed as a percentage. For instance, system requirements say that the clients whose trading volumes do not exceed $1 million per month are charged a flat fee only. For those whose trading volumes is between $1 million and $10 million, an additional fee is applied – $1 per trade. Trade beyond $10 million cap are rejected. The group with the volume from $1 million to $10 million should be shown in the exceeded volume report. For the report functionality, all clients within each group are equal even though their trading volumes are not. Hence, it's enough to pick only one client from each group to check if they are present in the report. Number 2. Boundary Value Analysis or BVA is an extension of equivalence partitioning, but can only be used when the partition is ordered, consisting of numeric or sequential data. The minimum and maximum values of a partition are its boundaries. Let's consider our previous example. We need to determine that our boundaries are set correctly. We test the first partition, the flat rate one, by checking the $0 value and the $1 million value. For the second partition, the one with an additional fee, the $1 million plus one cent value and the $10 million value are checked. The last partition, which is rejected on the exceeded volume basis, is checked with the $10 million plus one cent value. The behavior at the boundaries of equivalence partitions is more likely to be incorrect than the behavior within the partitions. It is important to remember that both specified and implemented boundaries may be displaced to positions above or below in relation to their intended ones, may be omitted altogether, or may be supplemented with unwanted additional boundaries. BVA will reveal almost all such defects. This technique can be applied at all test levels. It is generally used to test requirements that call for a range of numbers. Boundary coverage is measured as the number of boundary values tested divided by the total number of such values, normally expressed as a percentage. Number 3. Decision tables are a good way to record complex business rules that a system must implement. When creating decision tables, the tester identifies conditions and the resulting actions of the system. These form the rows of the table, usually with the inputs at the top and the actions at the bottom. Each column corresponds to a decision row. This technique is sometimes also called a cause-effect table. The values are usually displayed as true-false or discrete, but can also be numbers or ranges of numbers. A full decision table has columns test cases, to cover every combination of conditions. By deleting columns that do not affect the outcome, the number of test cases can decrease considerably. The common minimum coverage standard for the decision table testing is to have at least one test case per decision rule in the table. 
Coverage is measured as the number of decision rules tested by at least one test case divided by the total number of decision rules normally expressed as a percentage. The strength of the decision table testing is that it helps to identify all the important combinations of conditions, some of which might otherwise be overlooked. It also helps find gaps in the requirements. It can be applied at all test levels. Number four, state transition testing is a black box test technique in which test cases are designed to exercise elements of a state transition model. Components or systems may respond differently to an event depending on a current condition or previous history. A state transition diagram shows the possible software states as well as how the software enters, exits, transitions between them. A transition is imitated by an event, often a value input. The same event can result in two or more different transitions from the same state. A state transition table shows all valid and potentially invalid transitions between states. State transition diagrams normally show only the valid transitions and exclude the invalid ones. Tests can be designed to cover a typical sequence of states or transitions to exercise all states or transitions or to test invalid transitions. According to the STQB syllabus, the state transition testing can be used for menu-based applications. The technique is also suitable for modeling a business scenario having specific steps or for testing screen navigation. For this test technique, coverage is usually measured as the number of identified states or transitions tested divided by the total number of identified states or transitions in the test object, expressed as a percentage. Number five, use case testing is a black box test technique in which test cases are designed to exercise use case behaviors. A use case can include possible variations of its basic behavior, including exceptional behavior and error handling. For example, let's look at online store checkout. We test it based on the user scenarios. Case number one, a client finds a product, adds it to the basket, chooses a delivery method and pays for his order. Case number two, another client finds two products, adds them to the basket, chooses the self pickup method and the pay at the pickup spot option. Case number three, yet another client finds the merchandise, adds it to the basket, then deletes it, then finds something else, and etc. Coverage can be measured as the number of use case behaviors tested divided by the total number of use case behaviors normally expressed as a percentage. Now let's look at the white box test techniques. The ISTQB Foundation Level Syllabus outlines two of them. They are statement testing and decision testing. Number one, statement testing. A statement is an entity in a programming language which is typically the smallest indivisible unit of execution. The statement testing technique exercises the potential executable statements in the code. The objective is to ensure that all such entities have been tried at least once. For statement testing, coverage is measured as the number of statements executed by the tests divided by the total number of executable statements in the test object normally expressed as a percentage. Number two, decision testing. A decision is a type of a statement in which a choice between two or more possible outcomes controls which set of actions will result. To do this, the test cases follow the control flows that occur from a decision point. For decision testing, coverage is measured as the number of decision outcomes executed by the tests divided by the total number of decision outcomes in the test object normally expressed as a percentage. When 100% statement coverage is achieved, it ensures that all executable statements in the code have been tested at least once, but it does not ensure that all decision logic has been tried. To achieve 100% decision coverage, you try all decision outcomes, which include the true and the false ones, even when there is no explicit false statements. For example, in the case of an if without an else. Achieving 100% decision coverage guarantees 100% statement coverage, but not vice versa. Now, let's look at the experience-based test techniques. When applying experience-based techniques, we derive cases from the tester's skill and experience. These techniques can be helpful in identifying tests that are not easily detected 
by other more systematic techniques. Depending on the approach, these techniques may achieve varying degrees of effectiveness. Because of that, coverage can be difficult to assess or may not be measurable at all. So, one more time, experience-based test techniques are the test techniques based only on the tester's experience, knowledge, and intuition. Here are some commonly used experience-based techniques. Number one, error guessing. It is a test technique in which tests are derived on the basis of the tester's knowledge of past failures or general knowledge of failure modes. Error guessing is a technique used to anticipate the occurrence of errors, defects, and failures based on working with similar functionalities, including how the application has worked in the past, what kind of errors tend to occur, and failures that have come up in other applications. Number two, then we have exploratory testing. It is an approach to testing whereby the testers dynamically design and execute tests based on their knowledge, exploration of the test item, and the results of previous tests. The results are used to learn more about the system and to create tests for the areas they may need more attention. This kind of testing is most useful when there are few or inadequate specifications or there is a significant time pressure. Tests are usually not planned in advance. The team just launches the system and tries locating the bug clusters. Exploratory testing is sometimes session-based, constrained by a defined time box, with the tester using a charter containing objectives as a guide. Exploratory testing can complement other more formal testing techniques. Number three. Checklist-based testing, which is an experience-based test technique whereby an experienced tester uses a high-level list of items to be noted, checked, or remembered, or a set of rules or criteria against which a product has to be verified. In other words, testers design and execute tests to cover the conditions found in a checklist. For example, a checklist for testing a login form would probably contain the following steps. Check empty login and password fields enter a wrong password or no password at all, and etc. As part of the analysis, testers create a new checklist or follow the existing one as is, or with modifications. Such checklists can be based on a tester's experience, knowledge about what is important for the end user, or an understanding of why and how the software fails. And that is it for the fourth chapter of the ISTQB Foundation Level Preparation course. Good luck with your studies, and I will see you at chapter 5.